Good morning. Welcome to our service on this nice, cool summer morning. This morning we have uh, a new soundboard that's being um, used. So if there's some glitches, uh, they'll be corrected sooner or later. Talking about food, that's one of my favorite subjects. Got me thinking about the food in the Bible, different places where it's mentioned. In Genesis, Adam and Eve, all they had to do was go out and pick whatever they wanted off the trees in the garden. Sounds like a wonderful life. If you remember when Daniel was a young man, they tried to get him to eat the king's food. He said no, no, and he stayed healthy. In fact, he was even more healthy than the king's, the king's food people. Do you remember Esau? He was hungry one time. He sold his birthright for a meal. And then there was Martha who was fixing in the kitchen. And what happened? Mary didn't help her. But Christ said it was more important to be at his feet than it was to fix food. But it wasn't too long after that and Christ had 5,000 people that he fed. So food was important. And now we even share a meal that Christ gave his disciples with the Last Supper. Food has played a a biblical long line uh, that we follow through the Bible. Let's open with some songs.
We're going to have our prayer for the offering at this time. If you notice the um, red roses in front here, Connie told me this morning that she picked them from the front of the church. And um, she said that the uh, rose bushes are about done for. They're on their last leg. It's amazing what beauty can come from something that's just about done for. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the many ways you bless us, for the beauty of flowers, for abundant food, for loved ones to share it with. May these offerings be shared with the poor, the unjustly accused, and the hungry. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we are going to have with us Melody Davis. Melody is um, in Virginia, and you get to see a picture of her family right here. She wrote a book called uh, Whatever Happened to Dinner, and she's worked for Minnow Media for approximately 40 years. She's retired now, I believe. Uh, can you hear me, Melody? Yes, I can hear you. I just turned my uh, thing back on. So, yeah, hi. How are you this morning? I'm uh, a little bit nervous, but we're good. <laughs> okay. Nervous for the technology more than anything, right? <laughs> uh, uh, you will be able to share a little bit with us about yourself a little later or when you start your sermon. But I have about two questions for you right now. I wonder, um, what's for dinner today? <laughs> I I just told my husband, um, did he want to have the leftover chicken barbecue and me the check leftover meatloaf for lunch and I'll make some mashed potatoes? Or, and he said, well, I thought we'd go out. So I think that's what we're doing today, uh, which I appreciate. We just came through uh, a week with our grandsons and some cooking and all that. And um, anyway, yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Well, the second question is, how big is your table? Hmm. Well, yeah, I like your question. Um, there is a picture, I think, coming up at some point. There's this long table. Um, it holds about 20 to 22, depending on the children, at the end of the table um, can be squeezed. Um, and it's made by an Amish uh, business in, there in Goshen, Indiana, near Goshen, Indiana. Uh, yeah, that's not quite as far as it can stretch. So, uh, yeah, we love it. And people, are, uh, people enjoy uh, having a, a long table like that. Okay. Well, you can say some more about yourself if you'd want before you uh, bring the message. Uh, now we're going to read the, um, the scripture for this morning, and then I'll have a prayer for you. The scripture this morning is Luke 12, 13 to 21. And when I read this, there was two questions that stood out to me. One question was, what shall I do? Now this, this old farmer, well, he was an average age farmer. He was in his late 50s. And he had a big 300 bushel corn crop and his beans made over 100. And he said, what shall I do? And then the second question was, who will get what you have prepared? Now, he thought he was preparing for himself, but he didn't get the chance to uh, take life easy like he wanted to. Let's read the scripture. Luke 12, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. 
the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask your blessing on Melody this morning as she brings us your word from Virginia. Open our hearts that we may hear and maybe even catch some of the aroma of your message for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Melody? Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, and that was an interesting way you went through the Bible, talking about different food stories, and um, I'll be sharing another one of them after a while, but uh, it, it was it was great. It, it, I thought, oh, wow, yeah, I forgot about it. So, and, um, well, we were hosting uh, two of our grandsons uh, while their parents went on an anniversary trip. Um, so this week I was busy cooking and being kids out of um, uh, up with each other. They're, they're, they're good. They're very good kids, but ages 10 and almost eight. So I'm guessing that uh, their names are Sam and Owen that were with us and um uh, these are common names. Maybe you have some of those in your uh, congregation. Um, then let me see here. Oh, it was this was a good reminder um, for me to remind it of what what it takes to put a meal on the table with your family when their family is all at home. Uh, the big picture you saw there. Um, and especially when there's active children in the in the house, you know, they like to set the table, but sometimes they'd rather not and all that kind of stuff. Um, we've had cousin camps at house about three times now uh, that we have a total of six grandchildren, uh, five grandsons and one little granddaughter who was born uh, a little over a year ago. Um, so it's I, I we're really in, enjoying this aspect of, of family. I wanted to also just show you real quick, and I think you can see it maybe. Uh, this is my growing up family. These my brothers in the back there alongside me. I'm much shorter, and then my uh, two sisters on each side of my mom. My mom is deceased, but um, and I was able to write a book with my siblings. Um, and I, I'm showing this because this lets you see my dad as a farmer and my mom as a, a farmer's wife in Indiana. They, we, in, um, in uh, near Goshen. Yeah. Um, that's enough of those probably, but I, we're talking about family mealtime and you can see the, the book that I have back there of the dog waiting for her share. Um, you know, time is a disappearing tradition in many families and in our culture. Um, but I feel like it's part of the bedrock we need to continue to lay as extended family, really, and keep getting together, the reunions and the, the meals, uh, even when it becomes a little bit hectic. I'm really glad your pastor, Jessica, asked me to address this topic from a book that wrote Oh, it's about 15 years ago now, and here's a copy of the book, um, uh, which was inspired even earlier. There was a, a high school class in Harrisonburg. They invited me to come talk to their um, family life, junior, senior class. And to get things started, I asked the kids, um, well, who does the cooking at your house? And I like the question Mark asked here. Um, and... I was gobsmacked <laughs> with their uh, responses because they said, well, oh, that's everyone for themselves. 
it's a stock supper, dinner, whatever. Or I pick up a sandwich somewhere every night, and uh, they were working out also, uh, high schoolers, late schoolers. Um, oh, we, we have fast food or whatever. These were students talking, and I was, I was, I didn't know that bad that they were not practicing or didn't have regular family meal time. So I wrote about that in the newspaper column that I used to write about 30, 37 years. Um, and I was ex excited to hear from the readers close to my age at the time who were also pretty shocked at these kinds of answers. However, I will say, I will be the first to say that it's hard to manage meals for family life today, given the number of activities we engage our children in. These activities are wonderful in and of themselves, but make it very hard for parents to sometimes um, try to juggle soccer practice and ball games and swim meets and taekwondo lessons and tennis lessons and more. Um, these five grandsons are all um, involved in these things. And my oldest daughter told me recently that quite often they've been succumbing to just having sandwiches to tote wherever they're going. Um, they or they eat late when they get home. She and her husband, like some of you, I imagine, um, also have some food allergies or whatever. Her, her oldest son has celiac disease, uh, gluten free, needs gluten free food. And her husband has some pretty, pretty severe um, heartburn, other reactions to certain kinds of spicy foods, which he loves. But um, I, uh, so she sometimes has to make three different meals. Um, or maybe declare, okay, this is pancake night. We're going to just have pancakes for supper. Um, so sometimes it's things, you know, that the children don't like. And um, I will put a good word in for her husband here that he takes over all the dishwashing and cleanup and cleaning the house, even though she does most of the cooking in their family um, and makes a real effort at at trying whenever they can to to sit down together. So why bother with the time? Uh, I think that we need to talk, that gathering regularly together around table, chairs, or the couch, or if needed, in the minivan, helps important connections with family members. Um, we had a birthday spent, uh, a birthday party that we kind of held in our minivan with some of the friends of the, the birthday girl. Um, and um, yeah, you do what you can or do what you need to do to, to get to where you need to go. Um, I, you know, just came to the Easter season a couple of months ago. Um, I, talking about those connections and it was mentioned in the, the um, uh, Mark's intro there. Think of that supper that Jesus had with his disciples. You know, even though one of the disciples had already betrayed him, they were all there. And so gathering together forms ties and hopefully conversations and bonding. Not always. And I'll get to that in a minute. When I worked in this book, I there was uh, a program called the National Center on Addiction Drug Abuse. Uh, and that goes by the title, if you look it up, Partnership to End Addiction, which is going the wrong direction uh, in trying to end addiction. I was somewhat surprised back at that time to learn that a, a 2009 study found that compared to teens who have frequent family dinners, like four or more times a week, those who don't have frequent family dinners are twice as likely to end up using tobacco, marijuana, and are twice as likely to try drugs in the future. I don't know how that compares to today, but I'm, you know, drugs are, haven't gone away yet. Um, of course, these kind of, uh, this is not foolproof in any way, shape, or form. Kids will be kids, teens will be teens, and unfortunately way too many go the way of their peers and try substances become addiction. They may grow up in families where great difficulties abound, like divorce and being and abuse and mental issues. Um, being caught with drugs and living in jail. I looked up some more recent studies, including the current rage, shall we say, with vaping, 
I have watched college kids at our local football stadium hide the vaping or trade with others, but they're trying to even do it in the state, which you're not supposed to do. But then we've also went to having adult drinking there, or you know, not not soda but beer, that also goes in our college stadiums these days, which is a problem that I cringe at. And frankly, um, adult drinking didn't used to be used uh, allowed in that stadium. So we should be addressing in homes and families. There's another enemy attacking our families, and it's uh, quite innocuous or innocent on the surface. I found that in our family, uh, okay, I think I'm back. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me know if I can, you can't. Um, okay. Uh, I was saying that there's another anim, enemy attacking our families, and that is work. When our oldest daughter was 16, she started her first real part-time job at a local grocery store. Uh, suddenly our lives, especially um, evening meal times, were more fractured than ever. And the employer uh, who wants your child to work Sunday afternoon, and suddenly it sinks in with dad that those Great old-fashioned Sunday afternoon drives with the family or going for a hike in the mountains or float down a river will be even less frequent. So jobs can be a real um, destroyer of family. I hope we're, you're hearing me. <laughs> anyway, um, as parents, we need to pay attention to whether our own work schedules take precedence over mealtime. Okay, so what do children get besides a meal when everyone tries, makes an effort to eat together? Hopefully they get focused attention. They learn how to have dinner conversation, maybe, times of laughter and sometimes downright silliness. Uh, it may also be the only time your family gathers to pray and ask a blessing. I mean, I don't know if you do bedtime uh, uh, prayers in your families, but um, I find that, at least for my husband and I, that's the time that we pray together. Sometimes that simple act, especially if you've been arguing or grouchy or rushed, or um, it forces families to change gears a bit and perhaps find peace amid current troubles. Okay, I got the message that you can hear me. Good. <laughs> All right. Many times food preferences emerge at mealtime and stubborn little faces or sometimes big faces stare at food lovingly prepared and put on the table. I don't like that, goes Kid A. And soon a chorus says, can I just make a peanut butter sandwich instead? And it goes around. That doesn't end up being a happy meal time, does it? My husband was known in his family for his substitute meal of peanut butter sandwiches as a boy. And I'm happy to tell you that he has long since graduated from what his aunts used to tell me, that that was his standard supper. Stuart always had uh, peanut butter sandwiches for supper every night, according to them. Now, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> I was intrigued when working on this book uh, to learn about a time in the Old Testament when a woman named Abigail prevented an actual war, or at least a battle, using food, which is kind of where we're going here. I'm guessing that you maybe have never heard a sermon preached around this story, but I, I could be wrong. And that story is told in 1 Samuel 25, where David is having skirmishes at the time with King Saul. And David had a, a head, uh, he was the head of one his troop of men. As background, the Bible says Abigail was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. Uh, that meant Nabal belonged to the tribe of Jude. He was very wealthy. The Bible says he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. That would be a pretty big stockpile of wealth even today, I think. So one time, and this was at a time when David and his men were fleeing from King Saul. Um, and his men, uh, fleeing from King Saul and his men, 
David had heard that Nabal and his servants were nearby shearing sheep. David thought, hmm, wonder if we could get some supplies, food, you know, from Nabal. So David and his warriors had always been friendly to Nabal's guys, never robbing from them and treating and, and he treated them well. So David sent an entourage over to Nabal's camp and asked nicely, nicely and respectfully, um, let's see, I got lost here, if they could share some food and supplies. But Nabal, in response, was surly and mean, according to the Bible. Nabal's name even means fool. So maybe David was silly even to ask, but Nabal goes, why should I take my supplies and give it to men who come from who knows where? Hump, them's fighting words, as some people would say. And when David heard about Nabal's response, he told his guys, put on your swords. Then one of Nabal's ser servants, got, servants got wind of a brewing fight, and he told Abigail about Nabal's response to the request for food and reminded her that David's men earlier had been good to Nabal's and that David's guys had even formed a human wall of protection around their sheep camp at one point. So I would call this servant who tipped off Abigail a peacemaker. And that's sometimes what we need at mealtime. He, because he simply told Abigail to think it over and see what you can do. The servant did. He went on to say to Abigail, disasters hanging over our master and his whole household. Nabal is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Now, David was not exactly peaceful in his thoughts at this time, because the Bible says David was calling on God, praying to God to deal harshly with Nabal and his men. If he and his men left one male alive in Nabal's camp, David said he was going for the kill. Whew. The sides are set. The Old Testament is full of war stories like this, of course. But Abigail, bless her heart, gathered up bread and wine and lamb and grain and raisin and fig cakes. And without telling her husband, went with a party, a group, to meet David. Abigail and her piecemeal did the trick and David's men didn't pursue their plan to get after Nabal's men. So all is well. But Abigail gets home and Nabal was holding a banquet of some kind and you guessed it. He was very drunk. Smart lady waited until his hangover had cleared and told him how he how she had saved their household from certain death. At that the Bible says something like Nabal had a heart attack and did die. 10 days later. Well, the end of that story is that David never won to let a pretty woman slip away, promptly marries Abigail. And she lives happily ever after, I guess. I share this fighting story because we all know that times around our tables can become very ugly as well. Some families may in fact avoid eating together sometimes in order to keep peace um, or keep things quiet. But discussion can be directed to positive and insightful conversation, sharing experiences of the day, disappointments, hopes, and dreams. Online, you can find many ideas for different things to talk about beyond the overused, and I'm guilty of this too, question of how was your day or what did you learn in school? Well, they kids soon tired of these cliche questions too. Things you might want to avoid bringing up at mail time, meal time are mentioned here on a t-shirt I came up with at the time this book came out um, and had a, a local t-shirt maker produce. Okay, on the back it says, things not to talk about at dinner. Now, you can't probably, I'm not sure if you can see this, but anyway, things not to talk about dinner. And on the other side, this t-shirt says, let me see if I can get it, if you can see it. Um, it says, you shouldn't talk about Fs about the F that you came home from school with. You don't want to talk about grades, maybe at supper. Uh, can It can make somebody really upset, right? Talking about fat. Maybe we shouldn't talk about that at the table. There are places to talk about our nutrition. Faults. If you talk to, start harboring about the kids' faults or the adult folks' faults, uh, that doesn't go over well at meal. And then facts of life is the last one there. And by that, I mean, where do babies come from? Um, maybe you don't want to have that conversation at the table. 
So here are some topics that might help conversations in our home. I picked up just a few, but you can find more in places like from um, Focus on the Family. So for pre-kindergarten children, maybe something's fun like what makes you laugh? Uh, maybe they can answer that. Maybe they can't. What is your favorite food? What is the funniest face you can make? If you could be an animal for one day, what animal would you be? Might get some some responses or some conversation. Elementary kids, if you had one superpower, what would it be? Who's your favorite Disney princess or superhero and why? If your pets and our stuffed animals could talk, what would they say? What is your favorite book? What did you do to help someone else today? If you could meet anyone from history, what would you want to meet? Who would you want to meet? If you grew up to be famous, what would you like to be famous for? Finally, the high school age group might want to be ready to talk about what is the weirdest dream you've ever had? You know, get kids going on dreams that, uh, yeah. If you could eat only one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? What's your favorite family tradition? Sometimes, uh, yeah, and that you get, especially like at Thanksgiving or Christmas, maybe um, talk about those. If you could ask God one question right now, what would that be? So those are just some ideas that I found from uh, online. Jesus had much to say on putting priority on important in, and on important things in life. And this connects with our focus on foods and mealtimes. Um, and that was our scripture for today, Luke 12. Jesus tells the parable of the rich man who had produced a really good crop. And as he considered what he was going to do going forward, he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones to store all the grains and goods and maybe equipment. You know, uh, I grew up on a farm too. And we may wonder, well, isn't that just good planning to take care of your stuff? In this story in Luke, the rich fool says, now I'll take it life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God's response in Jesus' story is, you fool, this is very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Jesus goes on to finish his parable. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. That's Luke, um, yeah, 12 verses 20, 21. The take home I got out of this passage is what will all of our activities, our schedules, work, and overwork get us if we do not pay attention to godly priorities? Jesus turns the subject from inheritance and things to our attitudes toward them. And don't forget others who may not have family or friends to eat with, especially at holidays and birthdays and so on. Um, so as we weigh all of our interests and concerns and priorities, it is often hard to find to, to find a balance, keeping our hearts and minds focused on the end goal, ourselves and our families as true children of God and servants of Jesus, rather than slave to our work or other schedules. This will help keep our priorities in line. Finally, I, I want to wrap up with some true stories um, along these lines. My grandson... Uh, this was my oldest daughter's youngest grandson, surprised his mommy one day at the ball, ball field when he was still too young for playing t-ball. He was just three. His mother had hurriedly packed her bag with things they usually took to a ball game for his brothers, but she was in too much of a rush to even remember packing the usual snack. So as he was sitting with her watching one of his brothers play, he politely asked his mother, may I have a snack? She slumped a little and told him disappointedly, oh, I forgot and I didn't bring a snack today. He reached into the bag and came out with an apple he had packed, unbeknownst to her. He made himself and his mother so very happy. He reached into the bag and came out with an apple he had packed. Oh, I read that, okay. <laughs> I also had to smile at another true story from when this grandson was four. He came home from church talking about Cheez-Its. His mother thought he was talking about a snack again uh, that he had with the other children. No, he said firmly. In, learn, we, in church, we learned about Jesus. Jesus was a person. Of course, that was Jesus. 
now one more story a boy who, who grew up in our own church was part of the youth group uh leading worship on the fruits of the spirit um love joy peace patience etc toward the end of their presentation each youth was to give a one-line definition of love andrew age 13 at the time said love is my mom making dinner this andrew himself is now the father of two small children May those children and all of your own here or in your families grow up knowing that eating dinner together, or at least a sandwich, or even cereal together, is one way to show your love for each other. Amen. I do want to thank Melody for that message. May our 
tables be a place of peace and prayer and conversation. We have a Bible memory verse. Maybe we could say it together. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm and take care of it. Genesis 2, 15. Sending song. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.